A History of the Yoruba People S. Adabanji Akindi The Development of Early Yoruba Society During the roughly 15 centuries following the 4th century BC, the coming of the knowledge of the production and use of iron transformed the culture of the Yoruba and stimulated great cultural advances in their small settlements in the Ilu setting. According to archaeological evidence, the knowledge of iron came to the area now known as Nigeria as early as 700 BC. At Taruga in central Nigeria, about 55 miles, or 80 kilometers, southeast of Abuja, some remains of iron smelting activities have been dated to between 700 and 500 BC. How soon after this the knowledge of iron reached Yoruba land is not known, archaeological evidence has yielded dates in the 2nd century AD, but it is almost certain that its beginning in Yoruba land belongs to considerably earlier dates. The history of the beginning of the Iron Age in Africa south of the Sahara is, in general, markedly different from its history north of the Sahara, in the Middle East and in the Mediterranean world. In these places, people first learned to produce copper and its bronze alloy before they came to know how to produce iron. That is, there was a copper-slash-bronze age, which followed the Stone Age, and which lasted for centuries, before the Iron Age. In Africa south of the Sahara, on the other hand, the Stone Age was followed directly by the Iron Age, while the use of copper and bronze came later. For this reason, many archaeologists and other scholars insist that the knowledge of iron production must have come to sub-Saharan Africa from the Mediterranean world, either through Carthage, in modern Tunisia, or through Meroe, in modern Sudan or from the Red Sea through Oxum in modern Ethiopia. Their principal argument is that knowledge of metals through copper and bronze is a precondition for the knowledge of iron, and that peoples who had not had any knowledge of production of copper and bronze could not possibly have discovered how to produce iron. Other archaeologists and scholars, however, disagree with these views. They point out that the knowledge of iron could have been arrived at in West Africa through the processes of pottery production. The type of rock clay from which iron is smelted, called Egunari Guru in Yoruba, is the same type of clay for making pots. The firing of pots requires knowledge of production and management of high heat fires. In the application of such intense heats to clay pottery, it is possible that raw iron, called iron bloom, could have formed from time to time and remained unrecognized for a long time until, by and by, people recognized its nature and began to use it. It is significant that in some parts of West Africa the iron smelter was usually the husband of the woman potter. Moreover, the earliest date known for the evidence of iron production in West Africa, about 700 BC at Daruga, is considerably earlier than the beginning, about 500 BC, of iron at Meroe, the source from which West Africa is most generally supposed to have received the knowledge of iron production. In summary, the argument here is that knowledge of metallurgy through copper and bronze need not necessarily be a precondition for the discovery of iron, and that people in sub-Saharan Africa seem to have discovered iron as a byproduct of pot production. The implication is that Yoruba women potters were probably the first producers and discoverers of raw iron in Yoruba land. The available evidence suggests that in the centuries after 500 BC, then, the knowledge of iron was spreading gradually in West Africa. In Yoruba land, evidence of ancient iron works has been found in a few places. One at Ife Jemu in northeastern Yoruba land has been dated to about 160 AD. Another site has been found near an abandoned town near Monia in Ibadan in the Yoruba Midlands. Other places famous among Yoruba people as places of iron production are Isandunaran, Aloran, Ife, in central Yoruba land, and Idafin, in the northeast. The usual remains of ancient iron production are furnaces, kilns and heaps of iron slag. Iron smelting was a very hazardous occupation, involving the use of dangerously high heats. Partly for this reason, no doubt, Yoruba people always located iron smelting centers at a considerable distance from human habitation at a place in the forests where the iron-bearing type of rock clay was available. The smelting equipment consisted of the furnaces, for producing the high heat, and the kilns, for holding the supply of clay over the heat. The smelting process involved heating the clay until the iron bloom formed and was separated from the rest of the slag. This was cooled and then sold, as iron ingots, to blacksmiths who would use it to fabricate tools iron blades for machetes, hoes, knives, axes, arrows spears, as well as for household utensils. Early Yoruba people consigned iron smelting, and the fabrication and use of iron tools, to the patronage of one of their most senior deities, the god later known as Ogun, who was from earlier times worshipped as patron god of all working folks, probably, in these earlier times, with the name of Alaka Ea meaning, roughly, owner or wielder of the arms of all working people of the world. The iron smelting center was a shrine of this deity, with all the adornment and paraphernalia of a shrine and nobody who was not an initiate was allowed to come near it. 
The blacksmith's workshop was located closer to the village and sometimes inside the village, and the villagers could come there to buy or repair their tools. But it, too, was a shrine and, like the smelting center, was a place of frequent sacrifices to the patron god Ogun. Even people who only used iron tools in their daily occupations, farmers, hunters, woodworkers, sculptors, and so on, were supposed to offer sacrifices to Ogun. So highly did the Yoruba people esteem iron as a factor in their lives. After the discovery of crop and animal domestication, that is, agriculture, the discovery of iron was the greatest step taken by early humans in West Africa in the path of civilization. As material for tools, iron commands enormous superiority over stone. Iron-bearing clays are not as commonly available as stone, but they are sufficiently available in many places. Iron is much harder than stone, unlike stone, it can be molded or beaten into various shapes, and iron tools can, as desired, be made very sharp. The knowledge of iron came in a particularly fortunate era in Yoruba history, coinciding, as it did, with the growth of the Alu pattern of settlement. In practically all parts of Yoruba land, the traditions, folklore and legends seem all agree that, for each settlement, greatly increased security and peace was a major benefit of living in an Alu. By and large, an Alu was a haven of security, peace and stability for its villages. Consequently, the Alu setting was especially suited, and ready, to derive great advantages from iron when it was discovered. In Yoruba land, then, the immediate impact of iron was the improvement of farming tools and methods. Iron tools gradually took the place of tools made of stone, bone and wood. The iron-bladed cutlass or machete, for cutting vegetation, and the iron-bladed hoe, for tilling and digging, fabricated, we may suppose, only crudely at first, improved over time, making it possible for each farmer to clear and cultivate larger farms than farmers of earlier times who had used stone tools. The areas opened up as farmlands pushed the primeval forests farther and farther back. Probably quite early. Yoruba farmers learned from experience the wisdom of leaving every piece of farmland fallow periodically. That knowledge became an important asset for the management of soil fertility. As production increased, farmers evolved methods of storing and protecting harvested crops. Detailed information from traditions and yam festivals abounds all over Yoruba land about the handling of yam tubers, the most important food crop. The seasonal task of tying harvested yam tubers in rows on vertically standing stakes is celebrated with rituals and sacrifices in some parts of Yoruba land. That storage method ensured that the tubers were well aired and protected from pest and fungus infestation, it also ensured that they would not sprout suckers and deteriorate quickly. All this, together with the gradual increase in the variety of food crops, made food progressively more available. Almost certainly, the increase in the availability of food led to the beginning of slow increases in human population in Yoruba land, resulting in the emergence of more settlement groups, or Alu, in more areas of the country, and an increase in the number of settlements in some Alu. As the Alu experienced population increases, the forests separating settlement from settlement in each Alu gradually became open farmlands. The coming of iron, and consequently the general improvement in tools and skills and in people's management of their natural environment also resulted over time in improvements in the dwellings in which they lived. Gradually, we may suppose, people learned to build stronger and better houses ultimately with mud walls and thatched roofs made of selected durable wood, ropes and fronds. At some high point in this improvement in the building of houses, Yoruba people turned their skills to erecting buildings which kept each extended family group or lineage together under the same roof a logical outcome of their way of life and their group psychology which had evolved over many centuries. The earliest Agboila, lineage compound, thus came into being, each consisting of many dwelling units in one single building. Each building developed as a number of courtyards, around which the dwelling units were arranged. Traditions, and group behavior that survived into the early 20th century, would seem to indicate that the practice was to add a new courtyard when more living units were needed. It is not known how, in that type of approach, a group decided that an Agboila had reached optimum size and that another one needed to be started. But it did happen that, over many centuries, each Agboila came to contain about three courtyards as standard, while each settlement came to consist of a number of Agboila, or even some quarters each quarter being a segment comprising a few contiguous Agboila. Architectural and aesthetic improvements to the Agboila made it gradually stronger, safer, more comfortable, and more beautiful. The preparation of the earthen plaster for walls, and the setting up of walls, became more skillful, thus increasing the intricacy, safety and durability of wall structures. The weaving of the roof thatch became an art in itself, making it possible for roofs to last many generations with only minor repairs every few years. 
Minor roof repairs were done often, but roof replacements were done at intervals of generations, and each such replacement job was usually taken as an opportunity to improve, and restructure if necessary, the whole Agboila. Decorations became a standard part of the construction of an Agboila, and grew more and more detailed. It became standard practice to carve, using iron tools, and paint, or stain, the wooden pillars that supported eaves, typically in stylized anthropomorphic or animal idioms, and to carve wooden doors in bar relief, especially the large main door to the Agboila. Decorations also came to include murals, called Iwope, on wall surfaces some of them frescoed or engraved. All these features improved gradually in quality and beauty from generation to generation. Ultimately, with the broad and sweeping verandas, carved and painted posts holding up the eaves, and the murals on the walls, many in elaborate geometric compositions, the courtyards of some Agboila could look quite imposing. And all these decorations were extended to shrines also, so that shrines tended to be striking public buildings. In fact, the shrine became each settlement's prized possession over which skill and art were lavished. The pride over the beauty of shrines has continued to survive in the Iriki, praise poetry, of many lineages. The Iriki of many a proud lineage in many parts of the Yoruba land includes lines such as these. Akol abafai wope sag bahin ri, bila aboko sun one, e wopri avuni vuni, we build our shrines and finish them with murals. Even if a shrine building itself be not impressive, its murals would still captivate the passerby. Rivalries and competition between settlements and between compounds in settlements resulted in other forms of artistic expression also. One such was the Iriki, a form of poetry in which each group glorified itself and preserved in cryptic language the high points of its history. Over time, as the Iriki tradition grew, every unit of society, the settlement, the lineage, the leadership titles, and even the individual, came to have Iriki, and every Iriki tended to be amplified and grow richer in the course of history. Group pride also produced facial markings given to children at birth, to proclaim their ancestry, as well as exclusive group festivals, seasonal and annual, filled with special group songs and exhibitions of masks, and loud, elaborate, funerals for departed parents. All of these were features in the development of the identity and distinctiveness of the groups, settlements and lineages. That development had, perhaps, its most important product in the evolution of the Yoruba kinship system. Every group conceived of itself as a family, and the culture demanded that marriage had to be exogamous that is, people must, ideally, marry from families outside their own. As a result, each lineage contained many women who had been married from other lineages, and many members who were offspring of such women facts loaded with potential to dilute lineage cohesiveness, identity and loyalty. The Yoruba responded to this by evolving a rigidly patrilineal kinship system. By this system, every child belonged only to its father's lineage, had to be raised in its lineage compound and could only inherit title from it. As a corollary to this, when a woman married into another lineage, she became a member of her husband's group, she could never revert to membership of her father's group, and if she died her body had to be buried in the land of her husband's group. Hence, the Yoruba saying that after parents give their daughter in marriage, the appropriate thing to do is to remove her favorite childhood seat from their home and burn it, be a bomb omofoko, a enjo udarini. This was most probably the root of the norm whereby Yoruba girls were given in marriage only when they were adjudged to be mature, usually about 20 years or older, and capable of being independent of their parents as well as of being able to fit quickly and maturely into their roles in their new homes. Yoruba folklore has many tales of very serious penalties for mothers who dared to cling to their newly married daughters. The general improvement in tools and skills also accelerated the growth of division of labor, and the rise of distinct professions. We do not know whether the making of stone tools ever developed into a special profession, but in any case, the making of stone tools ultimately ceased as a result of the coming of iron. Pottery remained the oldest craft profession. For many centuries before the knowledge of iron, women potters had made pots at locations where suitable clay deposits could be found in the forests near their homes. Almost certainly, the potter's possession of iron tools for her work, for instance for cutting the covering vegetation and digging up the clay, increased her production capacity and may also have improved the quality of her pots. The association or guild of potters was probably the oldest professional guild or association in Yoruba history. Hunting, too, developed into a distinct profession. Although all men continued to be involved in farming the land and doing some hunting, using the greatly improved tools, iron-bladed machetes, knives, arrows, spears, traps, over time some men came to be more employed in hunting than farming, and the group of professional hunters ultimately came into existence. From the folklore and rituals surrounding the profession of hunting, it would seem that hunters were highly regarded from the beginning. 
Not only did they contribute to the meat supply, they also served society in some other ways. People depended on them to help find in the forests good clay deposits for the potter and the iron smelter, as well as springs and brooks sources of good water supply. But most importantly, according to the traditions, hunters provided security for their settlements. Closely allied to this, if a group or settlement needed to move and relocate, it usually depended on its hunters to find a good relocation site and the easiest path to it. The group of hunters in every settlement early became a highly regarded professional association or guild which developed its own unique folklore, its own chants, music and dance, and acquired a near-sacred public image almost akin to that of the iron smelters or that of the blacksmiths. What was true of hunting as a profession came also to be true of many other pursuits. Most women could plate women's hair but some became professional hair platers in their community. Most farmers could climb palm trees and harvest palm wine, but it became a profession for some. Some older women and men in every Agboila could carry out circumcision for children, but some, usually women, came to be recognized as the professionals in the provision of this important service. Depending on the occupations common in their home area, many persons grew up knowing how to make raffia yarn, weave some raffia goods, spin cotton yarn on spindles, weave cotton cloth, weave mats etc. Each of these pursuits, however, came to have its professionals. Yoruba people also began, after the coming of iron, to produce individuals who practiced art as a profession. The earliest sculptures would seem to have been done in terracotta, that is clay, almost certainly a development from the profession of pottery. The earliest carvings, made possible by iron tools, were presumably in wood most of it, probably, for the decoration of houses and shrines. By the later parts of the first century AD, Sculpture in stone appears to have become well developed also as well as sculpture in metals, especially cast or wrought iron. Most of the growing sculptural art was devoted to the worship of gods and spirits and the celebration of rulers, leaders and heroes. A fuller attention will be given to this subject of the development of early Yoruba art in the next chapter dealing with the early history of Ife. The production of palm oil remained always closely associated with farming, but it was nevertheless one of the most important industries in early Yoruba economy. The coming of iron tools, especially the machete and the axe, greatly improved the harvesting of palm fruits. The typical Yoruba oil mill, called Eku, evolved to handle the increased fruit harvests. The Eku was a large circular container built on an open rock surface, with the rock surface for its base, usually in some forest location. Inside it, the boiled palm nuts were pressed to extract the oil. The process, plus other ancillary processes, yielded not only the edible oil and fats, but also the palm kernel oil, used for medicaments and cosmetics, and various fuels for lighting, for cooking, and for use in high heat furnaces, like the iron smelters or the blacksmiths. The improvement of tools and skills enabled the Yoruba farmer to incorporate more and more crops into his farming. At some point in this long process, cotton became one of the crops he cultivated. It would seem from some folklore connected with the cloth industry that cotton and the weaving of cotton cloth first appeared in the broad belt comprising the Yoruba savanna and derived savanna countries of the Oyo, Igbamana, northern Ekiti, northern Igesa, Akoko, and the Okan Yoruba. This broad area was the vegetation belt most suitable in Yoruba land for cotton cultivation, and was also the natural home of most of the shrubs from which the Yoruba people obtained their dye stuff. Over time, some of these shrubs came to be regularly cultivated such as indigo. Cotton cultivation spread only slowly into the deep forests of southern Yoruba land, mostly into areas where agricultural activity resulted in more open vegetation. Even in such places, the cotton crop was prone to diseases because of the higher humidity of the southern Yoruba forest country. From the beginning, therefore, cotton cloth weaving in southern parts of Yoruba land depended heavily on cotton wool and dye stuff from the Middle Belt and the Northern Territories. Some Akiti proverbs seem to indicate that the Igbamana were probably the earliest leaders in cotton cloth production in Yoruba land. Like the practitioners of other trades, weavers evolved early into local associations or guilds, with rules and obligations and a guardian deity. Some sort of trading also evolved in the earliest Yoruba settlements. As settlement groups or Alu evolved, each settlement or village in an Alu developed a marketplace of its own so that there were many small market spots in each Alu. All over Yoruba land, Survivals of the separate early settlements have quite clear information in their traditions concerning their early marketplaces. Most probably, trading in each such marketplace evolved from simple exchanges of products among dwellers in the same village and, over time, became gradually more complex. The economic developments consequent upon the knowledge of iron would no doubt have speeded up the growth of trade as a factor in the lives of the early settlements. Increasing productivity in farming, 
in the production of palm oil and other palm products, in pottery, in the making of baskets, mats and cloths, and in the manufacture of iron tools and implements, coupled with the growing division of labor and the rise of distinct trades and professions all these would have created the condition for increasing the growth of trade, first in each village and then between villages in each ilu. A further development upon this, no doubt was that particular village markets became known as the best places to procure or sell particular products resulting in the gradual pooling of the Ilu into one market community. It is not known what mode of exchange was employed in this earliest of Yoruba trade. Some traditions, reinforced by some surviving traces of practice, suggest some sort of barter of products for products. The use of cowrie shells as currency almost certainly, as will be seen later, began in times before Odudua that is, before the 10th century. In the context of this age of varied growth and development, political organization of society also began and developed. Each settlement had a rudimentary government from very early, under the leadership of a headman. The oldest living male member of the group, he was a sort of ruler and priest. His religious authority and ritual functions sprang naturally from his being the group's father and the nearest person to the departed ancestors of the group as well as to the primordial spirits inhabiting the earth upon which the settlement stood. He was keeper of the totem and other secrets of the group. The group's totem was an object treasured by the first father of the group, a charm, article of personal adornment, favorite tool or artifact, etc., and believed to have been bequeathed by him to the group on his deathbed, to be kept as the symbol of the group's unity and identity. Sometimes, copies of the totem were made and given to members to keep or to wear on their persons, but the original was kept by the group leader and passed on to his successor. The group leader also kept and tended the group shrine made the daily, periodic and seasonal rituals, and offered the sacrifices. His authority in trying and punishing offenses was conceived of as flowing naturally from his religious authority and ritual powers. In modern political language, then, he was ruler, priest, judge and enforcement authority. From this point, Yoruba traditions generally paint an implausible picture of sudden transformation of each village or settlement into one that had a government with an exalted ruler, subordinate chiefs, rituals and orderly laws. Such phenomenal transformation is made to seem as if it all happened in one generation, such as from father to son, but we are certainly right to assume a development that lasted many centuries and many generations. What most probably happened is that each group, which later became a settlement, started off as one small family whose surviving members kept in close association for generations until they became a lineage that is, a group of families bound together by belief in common descent from a known ancestor. As the group grew larger, it kept regarding itself as one family, even if other persons joined it from time to time. The original family values of mutual loyalty and support, and individual acceptance of family rules and authority, continued as the group norm. The authority exercised by the father in the foundational family became institutionalized in the leader of the group. The original family demands on interpersonal behavior, and of group duty, became institutionalized into group rules and law. Continued expansion of group size and need slowly generated devolution in the performance of group duties, which then gradually produced institutionalized offices and officers, that is, chiefs and priests, below the level of the group leader, complete ultimately with titles and insignia. The leader's own title had to proclaim that he was father, head, and embodiment of the spirit, of the settlement. Hence, in practically every settlement, the leader's title came to include the name of his settlement as in Elefina, of Ifina, Obagio. Of Egeo, Alawagban, of Igban, Aro, of Villaro, and so on. Fittingly, too, in addition to these specific titles, the evolving national culture began to identify and address the rulers with general, exalted, titles that set them apart from the rest of humankind. The Elephina, Obagio, or Aro belonged to a special level of humans known as Olu or Osan or Oba King. It seems probable that which common title people used for king depended on which region they lived in. In some regions, people used Olu in others Osan, and in yet others Oba. An Akiti tradition has it that in most parts of Yoruba land people first used Olu or Osan as leader titles. At some very late point in the evolution of these settlements, their leaders began to wear a distinctive skull cap. Since the crowns of Yoruba kings have continued till our times to be regarded as sacred objects, it seems very probable that crowns started off as part of religious and ritual attire. For reasons unknown to us today, the ruler seems to have begun to wear some special cap as part of his religious garb as he performed the rituals and sacrifices at the shrine. Over time, wearing such a cap became a generalized part of his clothing while performing any of his other functions, even though the ruler's skull cap never ceased being regarded as a sacred, religious object. We have very clear descriptions of these earliest Yoruba crowns in the traditions. 
Moreover, some ancient recesses of some Yoruba palaces are believed to have samples of them. They were simple-looking caps woven from pieces of certain types of raffia yarn at first, and much later from certain types of cotton cloth and yarn not anything like the elevated dome-shaped or cone-shaped crowns of a later period of Yoruba history. The important consequence of the emergence of many compounds in each settlement is that each compound slowly, over many centuries, took on some life of its own a latter-day lineage. Each settlement thus became a sort of super-lineage comprising many small lineages. Particular leadership roles in the settlement became domiciled in particular compounds. When the bearer of any such title died, the inhabitants of the compound became responsible to the village for selecting his successor from within their compound. But since the title, and its duties, belonged to the whole settlement and not just the compound, the village must accept the appointee and install him. The system whereby the chiefs gathered in council around the ruler to manage the affairs of the settlement gradually evolved. In each compound, the oldest member was the compound head, vested by practice over time with judicial and other authority in the compound. As earlier indicated also, the farms pushed farther and farther away from the villages, even though the areas immediately outside each village remained the most intensively farmed. Moreover, from each village, paths radiated into the neighboring forests to the sites of the palm oil mill or eku, the pottery, the iron smelter, the brooks and springs, sources of the village's supply of water. From the earliest times, these special forest locations and the farmlands were conceived of as common property of the village. In this way, the Yoruba laid the foundation of the system of land ownership that later became a very significant feature of their culture. Although the oral traditions speak almost entirely of the roles of men in the ancient Yoruba villages, there are nevertheless glimpses of women's roles. The traditions are clear that, from the very beginning, women were the makers of pots of very important service to their settlements. For reasons not entirely clear to us, women were also the traders from the beginning. It is probable that this was a consequence of an early division of labor whereby the men cleared and prepared the ground and raised the crops, with significant assistance and backup services from the women and the women harvested most of the crops and offered the surplus for exchange, or sale. When yarn making and cloth weaving came to, they became exclusive industries of the women. The typical Yoruba loom, from early times, was the vertical loom installed over a shallow pit in the house. The other type of loom which also became common in Yoruba land, the horizontal draw loom, a specialty of the men, came much later and it long remained exclusive to northwestern Yoruba land, that is to the Oyo country. The women were, in early times, the greater actors in the spinning, weaving and dyeing processes which, over time, gave Yoruba land its very important cloth industry. But early Yoruba women may have been more active in the political process than the oral traditions would admit. For instance, it is possible that some very early influential position for women is what we have in very many folk tales about a woman with the title of Anison, represented always as first wife of the Osun, king. Within the palace of the Osun, the Anison wielded authority second only to that of the Osun himself. This very influential female official always starts off in each folktale as a glowing embodiment of power and authority, and feminine beauty, and then she is shown as coming to a tragic end on account of her wicked use of her power over the other women of the palace. It is significant, however, that in none of these folktales is the legitimacy of her authority ever questioned, her tragic end is always caused by the manner of her use of her authority. This seems to imply either that having women in positions of authority was acceptable, and perhaps even common in early Yoruba settlements, or that women did in fact occupy leadership positions but were, in a generally male-dominant culture, depicted as temperamentally incapable of using leadership positions well. The Anison was probably commonly mother of the settlement while the Osin was father of it. Admittedly, the Anison folktales do not rank as direct information about influential roles for women in early Yoruba settlements. About such roles for women in the kingdoms of later periods of Yoruba history, the oral traditions are replete with direct information. Women did become crowned rulers of Yoruba kingdoms in these later periods and it does seem improbable that such eminence would have had no root whatsoever in earlier periods of Yoruba history. Yoruba traditions hold up the development of herbal medicine as one of the triumphs of early Yoruba history. Slowly, over many centuries, the Yoruba people in their villages accumulated solid knowledge of countless herbs and herbal preparations for various sicknesses, as well as considerable knowledge of the nature of many diseases. Professional herbalists called Anaskan emerged on whom the people of the village depended for the treatment of their sicknesses. Over time, indeed, specialization developed in this profession so that there were those, called Anasconarimo, who specialized in the treatment of infertility in women, the management of pregnancy problems, the delivery of babies and the treatment of childhood diseases, 
those who specialized in the treatment of mental and nervous diseases, those who specialized in the fixing of bone fractures, and so on. From those early times, the profession gradually set up rules and procedures for the training of those to be admitted to it, 14 years of apprenticeship becoming a sort of general standard. The profession also evolved meetings of members for the exchange of knowledge, and established strictly binding rules of professional assistance of member to member. However, Yoruba herbal medicine, in spite of its ever-growing knowledge of diseases and treatments, never freed itself from its origins the belief that sicknesses were often caused by malevolent spirits. Therefore, even the soundest of herbalists continued to mix with his practice the appeasement of, or combat with, spirits, as well as divinations, sacrifices, rituals, incantations, protective amulets, around neck, waist and wrist, protective magical preparations, of powder or liquid, inserted into parts of the body through lacerations. All these started early and continued through later periods of Yoruba history as part of the herbalist's art. In the context of high rates of infant mortality, the belief early developed that some children, especially of mothers who lost many babies in succession, were not ordinary children but spirits who came to the world as babies only for the purpose of tormenting certain women. Called a baiku, born to die, these special children became the subject of a whole complex of lore, rituals and magical practices, all aimed at either warding them off from the women who were their victims, or forcing them to convert to real, ordinary, children if they were already born. In earliest times also, having twin babies was regarded as a bad omen or a visitation by malevolent spirits. Yoruba people never ceased regarding twin babies as beyond the ordinary, but the attitude to twins gradually softened until, in much later times, twin babies came to be regarded as friendly spirits or bearers of good luck, to be related to with special rituals and celebrations. Belief in witches and witchcraft also became an important feature of Yoruba life a witch being, according to Yoruba belief and folklore, a man or woman, most often a woman, who consented to hosting in her own person a malignant spirit sworn to causing harm to humans. Sicknesses which could not be explained or healed were usually attributed to witchcraft or the hostility of some spirit or deity. This usually provoked a heavy investment in sacrifices and rituals, and, if witchcraft was suspected, efforts to find and punish or appease the witch or to neutralize her powers. Herbalists developed potions which were believed, when ingested by suspects, to be efficacious in detecting the witch among them. And the penalty for being so publicly identified as a witch was death, sometimes by public stoning. The religion of the people of the early Yoruba settlements, started in their earliest days, grew and amplified. To the original earth spirits and protector spirits of the neighborhood hill or rock or stream were, over centuries, added more and more gods and goddesses and spirits. Settlements and lineages deified prominent departed members and set up shrines to them as special friends and protectors in the spirit world. As various occupations developed, patron gods and goddesses emerged for them for farming and other working folks, for women traders in marketplaces, for weavers and dyers of cloth and yarns, for potters, for herbalists etc. Certain natural phenomena, such as lightning and thunder, and the sea, certain diseases all came to have gods or goddesses associated with them. Over time, some deities became generally accepted and worshipped throughout Yoruba land. The god later known as Ogun, originally patron god of all working people, seems to have been the first of such pan-Yoruba gods hence his salutation as Ozenmol, first, or king, among the earliest spirits or gods. By the 10th century, or perhaps even considerably earlier, the main outlines of Yoruba cosmology and religion had evolved. The Yoruba conceived of all existence as located in two realms a lower realm known as I, the earth or the world, the abode of humans, and a higher realm known as Orun, heaven, the home of the spiritual beings. The realm of the spirits was conceived as consisting of two spheres a higher and a lower. The higher was the place of the supreme Aladamir who created all things and ruled over all of existence. This supreme being was first given the name Orisa roughly meaning the source from which all things emanated. Later, to his name was added Alarun, king of heaven, and Aluwa, king over all. Though some Yoruba groups, especially the southern and eastern peoples like the Ijesa, Ondo, Ikale, Owo and Akiti, continued to apply the name Orisa to the supreme being, that name generally came to be used for the highest heavenly beings who were said to have been with the supreme being at the time when the supreme being created all things, and whom the supreme being later sent to the lower spiritual sphere where they became the most senior gods. The Supreme Being's sphere was so far above the human's world that humans could not worship or relate directly with him. Therefore, only in a very few places in Yoruba land did shrines emerge for his worship. Generally, Yoruba people believed that no human could know what sacrifices would be acceptable to Alarun or Aluwa. At some late time, 
Alarun or Alua also acquired the name Aladamir, a difficult name that has been variously translated or deciphered. The central word in this name is Aju, which means fullness, or totality. For this reason, Aladamir has been translated by some as the absolute fullness that encompasses all. Oluolana suggests that its best translation would be the king who holds the scepter, wields authority and has quality which is superlative in worth and, permanent, unchanging and reliable. The second heavenly sphere existed in very close proximity to the world of humans and was the home of all the other gods, collectively known as Imol, and the spirits, all arranged in grades from the highest to the lowest. The highest category consisted of the Orzas namely, Orzimla, Arch Divinity, Ifa, God of Wisdom and Divination, Ogun, God of Working People and of Iron, Esu, Messenger of the Senior Gods, and others. Of these, Orzimla came to be regarded as the most senior, he was believed to have assisted Aladamir in the act of creating man. A goddess named Ajudu was regarded as wife of Orzimla and mother of the gods, Ayamalori Imol. In certain liturgies and localities, the name of this goddess later became confused with the name Oduduwa, the name of an important male personage in later Yoruba history. Oduduwa was later deified, as a male god, Ajudu is still worshipped in some places in Yoruba land as Ajudu, not Oduduwa, Ajudu's shrine and rituals still exist in Adu, in Ekiti, where she is worshipped as mother of all mothers and their little children. The total number of the gods, Imol, varied from region to region of Yoruba land but 401 appears to have been the commonest count. By the 10th century, many of the gods were already pan Yoruba in acceptance and worship. Such pan Yoruba gods increased in number in later periods of Yoruba history. Each Imol was concerned with a particular department or pursuit of human life and demanded a particular type of sacrifice and rituals. Below the level of the Imol were countless spirits, each in its own way in frequent contact with human life. Growing from the whole complex of Yoruba beliefs and religion, there emerged the powerful tradition of Yoruba divination the telling of hidden circumstances and of the future through carefully learned processes. Typically, the Yoruba assigned divination to the province of a god, Ifa, the god of divination. It is clear in the traditions that there were many kinds of divinatory practices and traditions in early Yoruba history, but over a long time they almost all became consigned to the province of Ifa. Some Yoruba traditions indicate a new contribution to the earliest rudiments of the Ifa system in Yoruba land but the extent of such contribution is uncertain. According to traditions recorded in the late 19th century by Samuel Johnson, there lived in Ife in pre oduduwa times a man of Noop extraction named Setilu or Ogbo Nyargun, the latter being probably the name given him by his Ife hosts. Ogbo Nyargun, practicing Ifa divination, lived in some places in eastern Yoruba land, including Adu in Akiti, and Owo, before he came to settle in Ife, where he acquired considerable influence on account of his Ifa divination and where he initiated many people into Ifa mysteries and divination. Some apparently older traditions, however, have it that the practice of Ifa divination was introduced to the world by the benevolent act of the God of Wisdom, Ifa, himself, through the instrumentality of his sixteen children, and that, in its early rudimentary form, it was common among the Yoruba, Noop, Edo, and Ibariba. The probable conclusion from these traditions and myths would seem to be that Ifa developed slowly from very early times in the context of the cultures of the Yoruba, Noop, Edo and Ibariba region. Thereafter, Yoruba creativity elevated Ifa divination and mysteries and enriched them with a profound body of folklore, until the whole Ifa system became a sophisticated theme in Yoruba religion and culture, and Ifa became a very important Yoruba god the god of divination and of hidden knowledge, the mouthpiece of the gods. In the long history of their development of Ifa and of Ifa mysteries, practices, divination and folklore, the Yoruba people gradually evolved a rarefied body of lore, knowledge and wisdom known as Aju Ifa, roughly, the body or fullness of Ifa wisdom. In its final form, Aju Ifa became the longest corpus of poetry in Yoruba folklore, a massive and ever-growing cultic body of wisdom encompassing historical and mythological accounts, exalted precepts, snippets of divine wisdom life-related instructions, and the profoundest in Yoruba philosophy. It developed, most certainly, from very many generations of the loftiest in Yoruba folk wisdom, and it was meant to be, and was, the special preserve of the select elite known as the Babalawo, father of the secrets, the priests of Ifa. As the exalted profession of the Babalawo developed, the initial schooling of a Babalawo, consisting of intensive, unbroken, instruction in the practice of divination and in spiritual development, an unfaltering memorization of the entire Ajuifa, was generally supposed to last for 14 years, but in reality his education was a lifelong pursuit. The nature of the Babalawo's life and profession demanded that he should be in regular contact, sharing and collaboration with other Babalawo. 
in every settlement and in every ilu, an association or a guild of Babala Warli came into being. Another very important development in Yoruba religion and cosmology was the belief in the afterlife. The Yoruba believed that the dead went on to live in another place of existence, some part of the heavenly realm, from where they could see, interact with, and help humans in this world. For that reason, articles of clothing and of personal adornment, articles of food and of domestic value, were buried with the dead in order to help them settle in their new otherworld homes. The newly dead was believed to be welcomed home by family members who had earlier died. The quality of life that one would have in the afterlife was believed to be determined by the good or evil life that one had lived in one's earthly life and, for this reason, Yoruba society thought of its aged members as typically honest and trustworthy, in preparation for the afterlife. But there were also ways in which the living could assist their dead into a place of status and honor in the afterlife. One such way was a big, expensive, and prestigious funeral the objective of which was to put on show, to both the living in this world and the people of the afterlife, the wealth and high status of the deceased, as well as his or her success in having many prosperous children. Another way, especially for the great and influential, was that the deceased's children would add a second burial ceremony far more expensive and more demonstrative than the first. For this second burial, the children of the deceased would commission a life-size naturalistic sculpture of their dead parent, which they would then dress in gorgeous clothes put on show for a couple of days, and then bury. This is the second funeral ceremony known as Akuinowo. For the deceased who had been a great hunter in his earthly life, another kind of help was also commonly given. This was made necessary by the belief that the spirits of the animals that the deceased had killed as a hunter could ambush and harass him on his journey to the afterlife and make his journey unpleasant. To prevent such, the hunter's children would mount a standing, life-size, effigy of their deceased father, dressed in his clothes on the way to his farm and the belief was that the animals would fix their attention on the effigy as if it was the hunter himself, while the hunter made an undisturbed journey to the afterlife. This practice was known as a paid or I paid. The den were also believed to reincarnate in their descendants, and to come occasionally to visit their communities. The belief in reincarnation led to the practice of giving personal names that identified some persons in every Yoruba family as reincarnations of departed parents, and the belief in the occasional visits of loved ones from the other world produced the Agungun cult. The annual calendar of religious rituals and festivals in every Yoruba community included one or two celebrations when Agungun represented by masked persons believed to be loved ones from the afterlife walked the streets and visited homes. The Agungun came in various types of masks, in combinations of cloth fronds, varieties of raffia, beautifully carved wooden pieces, decorations with beads, cowrie shells, etc., and for various purposes. Some were very serious, very portentous manifestations specializing in performing rituals beneficial to society. Others went from home to home praying for and blessing people. Yet others entertained people with dancing or with sayings loaded with deep folk wisdom or with tales from Yoruba folklore. Some of the lighter ones just roused their community by fighting mock fights with people in the streets or by bearing whips and playfully chasing young people from compound to compound. In most communities, some prominent lineages came to have unique masks and a gun gun of their own. The Agungun cult in every community had a highly revered priesthood, made up usually of men, since women were not supposed to be exposed to Agungun gun mysteries, but always including one or two highly placed priestesses. From a complex interplay of Yoruba religion and ritual practices and mysteries, of Yoruba knowledge of herbs, the power of herbs and of herbal preparations, of the mysteries of Ifa and divination, and of witchcraft and the occult, there ultimately evolved a more or less distinct profession whose practitioners came to be known as Adahunts. The Adahunts concerned himself very little, if at all, with herbal medications for health delivery purposes, or with treatment of the sick, or with divination as such. While he would usually know and employ any or all of these skills, his real focus was on the occult employment of herbs and other materials from nature, as well as the use of incantations, curses, charms, and amulets, to enable his clients to accomplish stated social purposes good purposes such as success and wealth, evil purposes such as hostile occult interference in the lives and affairs of other persons, or power purposes such as protection from certain weapons, or ability to dematerialize, or the ability to engage in out-of-body actions. Usually feared by all the people of his community, the Adahans, in the full maturity of his art, had as his clients mostly rulers, kings, chiefs, warriors, the powerful, the influential and the ambitious, the practitioners of hazardous occupations such as hunting, and other persons seeking success or wealth, or seeking protection from physical or spiritual harm. There were, altogether, many types of associations, guilds and cults in the early Yoruba settlements. 
but the most visible associations, to which everyone belonged, were the age-grade associations called Egbe, Atu or Igbamo. Age-grade associations very probably evolved in the earliest days of Yoruba settlements, no doubt in response to the needs of the settlements to provide an appropriate pool of labor for each of the various functions for which the ruler needed to mobilize people. Depending on age, one team could be called upon to keep the open places in the settlement clean, another to keep paths clear of ingrowing bush, another to effect repairs on public houses and shrines, another to give backup services during large rituals and festivals, etc. Over time, the originally informal teams became formalized and institutionalized into age-grade associations. The youngest association in a settlement was constituted about every third year, and was made up of youths about 9 to 12 years of age. The inauguration of the youngest age great association became a festival featuring consultations of the Ifa oracle, the rulers giving of a name to the new association, and the association's election of its officers. Persons so elected held the offices for life, and there were two lines of offices male and female. Over time, age great associations developed meetings, rules and regulations, seasonal and annual festivals, etc. Outside one's own family and lineage, the members of one's age great association came to be one's closest associates and support in all phases and happenings in one's life. The public duty of an association depended on its age from the youngest who kept public places clean, to able-bodied youths whose males could be called to military service, all the way up to the most senior citizens who were revered as the very essential pool of wisdom and guidance for their village. In the considerable security of life in the village and the Alu, then, the Yoruba slowly molded the building blocks of their culture. In the ordering of economic functions, the organization of political life and governance, the molding of the relationship with the world and with the powers of the supernatural, the overall outlining of the worldview, the centuries of Yoruba life in the village and the Alu laid most of the essential foundations. The primary building block of the village was the Agbo Ila, the lineage compound. Each constituting a home where many families lived together, all of them believing themselves to be one family. The Agbo Ila was a wonderfully fertile ground for cultural development, growth and refinement. Almost all the adult male residents lived by farming, supported by their wives and children. A typical day in the Agbo Ila, we may imagine, dawned with most residents, in their nuclear families, heading out to the farms, leaving behind the very old, the children, the nursing mothers, and those engaged in home-based occupations, like traders, weavers and dyers and, if there were any, herbalists, babalawo, blacksmiths etc. For much of the day, these homebound folks kept the Agbo Ila alive and busy with their various pursuits, while the children played various games in the dust in the open courtyards, under the eyes of the aged and the nursing mothers. The farming folks returned in the late afternoon, bringing headloads of farm produce and firewood. In the rest of the evening, each family cooked for supper, the main meal of the day. The hours after supper were the great time for socializing in the compound the men in groups around kegs of palm wine, and the women still doing all sorts of light domestic chores, like spinning yarn on spindles, gathering the children, if there was no moonlight, to tell stories, usually folk tales accompanied with songs and refrains. These night folktale sessions were beautiful experiences in education and artistic expression, and a major contributor to the famed Yoruba wealth in folklore. If the moon was up, the children, joined by those older children who had spent much of the day on the farms, played in the courtyards. Moonlit nights could be very lively, beautiful and noisy in the compound, as the children played running games, engaged in wrestling contests, or put up some drama from their perception of adult life a wedding, a chieftaincy installation, a festival, a dance, an intergroup disagreement, or a group meeting. In this whole context, Yoruba people invented many types of one-to-one -one and team games. Lineage meetings were frequent in the compound some for lineage business, others for the elders to settle quarrels or to try infringements of lineage rules of conduct. The Agbo Ila was a very major contributor to the economy of its village. Farm produce and other products flowed from each Agbo Ila to the village market food, articles of pottery, mats, baskets, cloth, cotton wool and yarn, etc. Some Agbo Ila became famous as a source of certain products. Professions and trades tended to run in lineages. Days of celebrations were many in the Agbo Ila village in lineage festivals and rituals, chieftaincy rites, domestic rituals, funerals of departed aged members. Weddings. A wedding was a celebration of a new pact and relationship between two, usually unrelated, lineages, the brides and the bridegrooms, and was always accompanied with colorful celebrations in both. In the full development of the Yoruba wedding over the centuries, the processes of the introduction of the contracting lineages to each other, the betrothal ceremony, and the ceremonial journey of the bride to her husband's lineage compound, 
All became greatly beautified by Yoruba creativity with dramatized banner, the giving of gifts, and the sharing of feasts. When all these were completed, the two lineages became linked together, ideally in perpetuity, by a bond of love and honor. The birth of a baby was a joyful event in the lineage compound and for weeks, the oldest women members would serve the baby and its mother as nurses and house help. Days of mourning were also quite frequent, and every death pulled the whole Agbo Ila powerfully together in sorrow. Probably more children died in infancy than survived it. The death of a young adult kept an Agbo Ila in mourning for days. The Agbo Ila buried its dead in the soil of its own compound and regarded them as continuing to be part of the lineage and as continuing to participate in its affairs. Children both those who were living and those yet to be born were regarded as important members of the lineage, in fact, the universal Yoruba belief was that the adults of a lineage held all its things and trust for its living and yet unborn children. In lineage caucuses, respectful references were commonly made to the ones who went before and the ones who will come, and some of the latter were regarded as direct reincarnations of some of the former a belief often expressed in the names given to new babies. The Agbo Ila took great care to involve its children in its affairs and rituals. Quarrels, often featuring noisy verbal exchanges, were, on the whole, common especially between women who happened to be married to the same husband. Over these and other kinds of interpersonal conflicts in the Agbo Ila, the lineage leader, Alori Ebi, spokesman for the departed ancestors, assisted by the lineage elders, exercised very powerful judicial and penal authority. In all matters pertaining to the lineage, the overriding principle was that every member, as descendant of the ancestors, had full rights to participate and express opinion and ensuring healthy respect for the exercise of such rights was one of the most important duties of the lineage head, assisted by the elders. The Agbo Ila was the place of education. The proper nurturing of an Agbo Isle's children was the collective concern of all its adults. Every lineage raised its young in its own image, and equipped them with a strong knowledge of its history especially its importance in the history of its village. This was the primary root of societal decency, and of the general historical consciousness, of the Yoruba people. Children also learned the professions and trades common in their Agbo Ila, and this is why trades and professions tended to run in lineages. All in all, the early Agbo Ila as part of the village was the most important factor in the beginnings of the evolution of Yoruba civilization. Throughout all the ebb and flow of Yoruba history even until the 20th century, the Agbo Ila, with its family group or lineage, was to remain the primary identifier, educator and maker of the Yoruba person. There seem to have been considerable contacts between various regions and localities of Yoruba land in times often referred to as before Odudua. Hunters are generally credited in the traditions as the pioneers who first opened up tracks in the primordial forests of Yoruba land, and as guides of early groups to good sites for the earliest settlements. From an analysis of these traditions, Saburi Biobaku writes, a bold hunter usually led the way and when a suitable site was struck, he founded a town. By the 9th or 10th century, however, Yorubland had clearly long passed the era of initial pathfinders. Many centuries of ever-lengthening paths from settlement area to settlement area would seem to have by then linked up Yorubland quite copiously, and fairly well-defined corridors of traffic were known to wayfarers, almost all of whom were herbalists, diviners and traders. The professions of the herbalists, Anaskan, and the diviners, Babalawo, seem to have early developed some built-in dynamic that impelled their practitioners to go further and further afield in order to learn more and more and make wider and wider contacts. It became ultimately a character of the two professions that the honest gunner Babalawo who was known to have traveled widely, to have resided in many parts of the country, to have established bonds with many members of his profession in distant places, was regarded as belonging to the peak of his profession. Such persons constituted a specially respected elite that traversed the country regularly and knew it quite well. Then, trade also developed early beyond settlements and settlement groups, or ALU. It seems clear from the traditions that the amount of long-distance trade traversing Yorubalan by the 9th century must have been quite considerable. Such trade no doubt accounted for the provision of iron to blacksmiths across the country. Some long-distance trade in sea salt also seems to have existed the earliest carriers of which would have been traders from among the coastal Ijebu. There was an ancient trade in herbal preparations, mostly a preserve of the herbalists. According to Robin Horton, by the 9th century AD, the Ife zone in central Yoruba land was becoming an area of some importance on the southernmost reaches of the Trans-Sahara trade routes from the Mediterranean coast, through the Sahara Desert and the grasslands south of it and across the river Niger. More will be said about this later. Suffice it to say now that this would mean that by the 9th century some goods from the Mediterranean and the Sahara Desert region were entering into the trade of Yoruba land.
It would also mean that Yoruba land was by then on the verge of the development of rapidly increasing long-distance trade. Until the very end of the period covered in this chapter, that is, roughly until about the 10th century, each individual settlement or village within an alu conceived of itself as a separate, autonomous, settlement, and resolutely clung to that perception. The force which originally stood separating settlement from settlement in an alu turned from forest to farmland, thus making the whole alu area more or less continuous opening in the forests. But that generally did not conduce much to a weakening of separateness. The farmland boundaries were well known and respected, and each settlement maintained its share of the paths dutifully to the end of its own land. Each settlement pushed additions to its dwellings only in directions away from neighbors' dwellings, and cleared more and more of the increasingly distant forests to provide for expansion to its farmland. The universal norm, sanctified over time by powerful religious and spiritual underpinnings, was separate, self-contained, settlements each with its own ruler and chiefs, its own protector god and spirits and shrines, its own rituals and festivals, its own marketplace, its own blacksmith's workshop, its own, as much as possible everything. For the rulers and citizens of each settlement in an alu, to honor this norm was to live in the will of the invisible powers that oversaw the affairs of humankind. However, strong forces gradually developed that slowly whittled down the norm. Most of these were economic. For instance, from time to time, a mat weaver or cloth weaver or blacksmith might become known as having some special artistic or other talent, and customers would come to him or her from all over. Some production facilities were not just replicable everywhere. For instance, iron smelting facilities were, in the end, few in the whole country, and blacksmiths must depend for their raw iron on very distant smelters. This lengthened the arms of trade not only beyond the village but also far beyond the Alu. As earlier pointed out, the construction of Agboila and shrines improved continually in complexity and decorations. Not every settlement could have the artisans and artists for these services, most settlements must employ people from other settlements or even from distant Alu. Over time, a guild or association developed for each of these trades, and its members served clients far and wide. Some village markets, as earlier pointed out, became known as the best places to sell or buy particular products, so that people from every village increasingly went there for those products. Over time, it became the way of life in the Alu that some village markets were open on certain days and others on other days. In this way, the four-day market cycle peculiar to Yoruba commercial life evolved each village market being open only every fourth day. Professional associations and guilds grew to establish links with their counterparts in other villages. It was, no doubt, in the context of these wider linkages that the association of herbalists, Anaskan, evolved their stringent, virtually sacred, rules of mutual help of herbalist to herbalist. This ensured that if one herbalist encountered a difficult case in his village, he could count on help from herbalists from other villages. The Babalawo, priests of the god of divination, Ifa, developed identical links and rules and so too did the Guild of Hunters. By and by, each of these guilds created festivals at the Ilu level. Intensive and very powerful linkages arose from the exogamous nature of marriages. And, most importantly, even though each settlement had its own protector spirit, all the settlements in an Ilu acknowledged and made rituals to a common protector spirit for the whole Ilu, and held its high priest in great awe and, from time to time, deferred to his ritual prescriptions or requests. The great surprise is that in the face of all these unifying realities, the rulers and people of the villages in the Alu setting persisted in regarding each of their villages as separate from its neighbors and as self-contained. The explanation, earlier stated, is that the religious or spiritual guarantees which sustained separateness as the norm were so powerful that no groups internal to an Alu could challenge them. That, as far as everybody knew, was the way people lived, and nobody knew any person or group of persons who lived any other way. All of the linkages among the villages in the Alu were looked upon, not as negating the separateness of each settlement, but as necessary support for it. The individual settlement was home, beyond that was the outside world. The rules of inheritance and succession fitted perfectly into, and reinforced, such a world view. But the forces of change continued slowly to increase in impact. Ultimately, by about the 10th century AD, the Yoruba world was ready for major steps forward. As it happened, the first of those steps were taken at Ife in the heart of Yoruba land. The great importance of Ife in Yoruba history, therefore, is that it was the first Yoruba village group or Alu to step out beyond the encrusted framework of many centuries into the bright lights of a higher political culture. The chapter that follows will tell that story of Ife.